Hey everybody, it's Dr. Trujillo. I'm a board certified orthodontist, a public speaker, and founder of Orthovated, and I'm here today to teach you about cephalometrics. Things like, why do I need to take a ceph? How is it gonna help me? What is the point of a ceph, anyway? So that's what we're gonna dig into today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I have put together a presentation uh, so you can see it. So I'll go ahead and just share that now. So you're probably wondering what is on your screen right now? Or why am I looking at an escape room? Well, I like to think of orthodontics kind of like an escape room actually. I just did my first escape room not too long ago. Ton of fun by the way. It was army crawling like in an Egyptian tomb. I was in real sand, finding clue after clue within a clue within another clue. Uh, you have to find all these, these clues that are locked away uh, in order to solve the problem and escape the room. Orthodontics is kind of a lot like that, right? You have all these clues, you have uh, everything that you're seeing, you have to come up with a diagnosis, execute it, and solve the problem and create that patient's ideal result. So escape room, I don't know, it kind of fit it a little bit for me. So why do we take a set anyway? What are the three main reasons for a lateral cephalogram? Keep in mind that there's lots of different reasons and we're just gonna kind of focus on those main three. Really the first reason is the most common reason we would take it is it's a snapshot in time that's gonna tell you, it's gonna define the patient's growth pattern that you're seeing in that moment. It's going to define if they have a skeletal open bite or a deep bite, if they're prognathic in one jaw versus the other, or perhaps deficient in one jaw versus the other. You can evaluate facial balance and growth spurts that might be coming down the line. Uh, and second reason why we might take a CEPH is because we can evaluate growth over time. There are certain structures in our cranial base from head and neck anatomy, which I'm going to dig into here in a moment, there are certain structures that actually do not change. They, you, they just don't, there's no growth, there's no changes. So I can superimpose those structures perfectly in order to see how everything around it is changing. If I superimpose those because I know there's no growth there, I can see how the jaws have grown and changed for this specific patient. That's the second reason. The third reason is I can also evaluate changes in the dentition and jaw structures from my orthodontic treatment. Did I correct that excess overjet by flaring the teeth or did I perhaps allow the lower jaw itself to grow forward and correct that overjet? So you can really see how your treatment has caused the outcome, basically. So a CEPH is really the clues these are the clues in your set that you need to solve your patient's case. So that's why I like to think of it kind of like an escape room. So here is the uh, slide for head and neck anatomy, uh, kind of going way back here. But it's important because when we're looking at these clues, we need to know what we're looking at. And if you really remember your head and neck anatomy, you'll be able to look at a set and it just logically makes sense what you're looking at. And when things make sense, you don't really have to memorize it, you just kind of remember it, right? So looking here, I'm gonna use my mouse cursor. You can see that this is our anterior cranial fossa, right? This is the anterior portion where the brain sits. Here's our sphenoid bone. This whole area is the sphenoid bone. But this little line right here, that's the greater wing of the sphenoid the greater ring of the sphenoid right here. And keep in mind, this is bilateral. So when you're looking at a cephalogram, you're actually seeing both of them kind of superimposed on each other. And so sometimes if they're not perfectly lined up, you will get two greater rings of the sphenoid. You just gotta kind of pick the average of the two. So that's our greater ring of the sphenoid. This is an important area here because the greater ring of the sphenoid does not change after like age six or seven. And so you can superimpose those on a set five years apart from each other and really kind of get an idea of how their jaws are growing um, from that. We have cella tersica right here. Remember that. And we have our anterior clinoid process. We have our posterior clinoid process. We have our cribiform plate right here. And the crystal galley is kind of that crest right there. 
So growth and development, uh, really those areas in Sella Cursica, this anterior wall, this little portion right here, and the cribriform plate, those two areas do not change. And so when you superimpose those two areas, you're actually able to see how the jaws have grown for this patient. You can see, are they a backward rotator, a forward rotator? You know, that might be important if your goal is to correct an excess overjet. Or is this patient growing class three? Have they been growing all along? You can really evaluate two different time points to see if the patient's still growing. Or if your patient needs an implant, and you need to verify that there's been no additional growth in this patient before they can get their implant, you can superimpose these structures. And then if from that superimposition, you can verify that there's been no changes in position in the maxilla or mandible, then you can begin to assume that growth has completed for the most part. So let's take a closer look here at a uh, cranial base. Here's that anterior clinoid process, that posterior clinoid process. Here is the cella persica right here. Here's that anterior wall that basically never changes that you can superimpose on. Here's the uh, cribriform plate and the crystal valley right here. And let's take a look from a different point of view here. So this is the anterior cranial fossa, right? So notice how it's it's not flat, right? It's not like a perfect bowl either. There's parts of the fossa that are you know higher up and then it gets kind of deeper as you go towards the midline. And then it gets kind of up higher. So when we're looking at our Ceph, you can see these lines here. This is the anterior cranial fossa. It's just, there's multiple lines because it's deeper in some parts than the other. So this lower line is more towards the midline, and this is more towards the lateral side of the anterior cranial fossa. If I draw a line from the anterior clinoid process and just keep going forward, I intersect the greater wing of the sphenoid right here. Keep in mind, again, that's the greater wing of the sphenoid. And if I keep going forward right here, keep going forward past the greater wing of the sphenoid, then it bifurcates. I can keep going straight, which is the cribriform plate, or I can bisect and go up, right? The crystal valley right here. These two structures don't change. So I can superimpose this line right here. I can superimpose the greater wing of the sphenoid, and I can superimpose the anterior wall of Cella Cursica, and now, everything is lined up and I can see that there's been no growth for that implant. Or I can see that the lower jaw has not grown class three over the last four years. So I feel pretty confident starting treatment in a 13 year old boy. Um, I can see all kinds of different things, but when you know what you're looking at, it just makes it that much easier to retain, right? So let's go ahead and go to our next slide here. Again, the red here is the stable cranial base structures that we use in order to superimpose. So when you're tracing these, they're not really helping you necessarily look at the snapshot, like look at the angles or the clues. It's really only for superimposition, which offers its own clues, but that's what those structures are for there. So here we are looking now at uh, some key points that I wanna make sure you, you understand these. So right here, Cella Tersica, if you imagine drawing like a perfect circle all the way around right here, and you draw a dot right in the middle of that circle, that is S point, that's cella. So that's how we know where cella is. And then if we draw a line or a point, I should say, where nasion, the nasal bone, meets the frontal bone, where the two meet, that's called end point or nasion. That's the name of that point. And then we have up here, I'll go ahead and move this up just a little bit. Uh, the most concave portion of the anterior part of the maxilla. So the most concave portion right there is A point. And then the most concave portion of the bottom here is B point right there. Now, if I draw a line from S, N, A, 
and I measure that angle right there, on average, it should be about 80 degrees. Now, SNB on average should be about 78 degrees, which means the difference of the two is what? 80 degrees minus 78 degrees equals two degrees. So plus two degrees is the average A and B angle uh, for a class one skeleton, orthognathic skeleton. So that means the bottom jaw is actually set back relative to the top jaw. If my top jaw were more forward, it would then become a negative number, like maybe minus three degrees, which means we're class three. So if we look at this little math equation here, if A is greater than B, the patient is either class one or class two. If A is less than B, the patient is class three. So here is a, a, a traced set. Now I can look at this set and it just gives me all amazing, like all kinds of great information. First of all, I can see, uh, is the patient class one? Is the patient class two or class three? In fact, this patient is me. This is my cephalogram. I can look at the, uh, the facial balance right here. There's all kinds of different things that I can see from this image. So those numbers are actually giving us clues clues to be able to see how our patient is growing, clues to help us treat our patient better. So let's go ahead, I like to, let's start with this clue. This clue right here is the E lines. So if I draw a line from the tip of my nose, straight down to the tip of my chin, that's called the aesthetic line. And my upper lip, if I measure how far behind that line it is, it's exactly five millimeters. And I know that because I have calibrated my set with this ruler right here. So I'm five millimeters behind. Now that's important because if I have a lot of crowding and I, you know, maybe not a ton, but a decent amount of crowding, would I want to extract teeth in myself? Probably not because my E lines are minus five, which means if I extract, it'll probably end up like minus eight. And that's beginning to be a little bit too far back. So aesthetics is in the eye of the beholder, obviously. But there are some standards that can help guide you. First of all, men should have E lines at zero to minus five on average. Women should have E lines at anywhere from plus two to minus three. So if you have a lot of crowding and you were like plus five, your lips were beyond your E-line, five millimeters, you had a lot of crowding and you didn't extract, you'll start at a plus five, but you might end at like a plus eight, which means you kind of made facial balance and facial aesthetics worse than they were when they started. So those are all things to consider. And that's an important clue. If I'm on the fence about whether or not to extract in this patient, I'll oftentimes look at that number as the kind of the tiebreaker. Um, another thing though is I'm an adult. So, you know, my nose is, is a lot larger and it's still growing, <laughs> unfortunately. But for our younger patients who have little button noses and plus numbers, their nose is still gonna grow. So that number is gonna keep falling back over time. So you do not treat your patient necessarily to that moment in time. You also treat to their face what it will be like in say five years or 10 years or 15 years. So we also want to look at the future there. Some other numbers here to look at are A and B is zero. That means I'm class three. This number right here is how flared are my upper teeth? And this number is how flared are my bottom teeth? So my upper teeth are flared at about 105 degrees, which is pretty good. My lower teeth are pretty upright. It should be about 90 degrees, but they're kind of more upright than that at about 83 degrees. And so I can just look at those numbers right off the bat and tell that I have a dental class three as well as a skeletal class three. This clue right up here tells me how divergent I am. So divergence meaning the Frankfurt horizontal, which is porion, which is the uh, auditory meatus here, the orbitale, which is the lower, most lower part of the orbit, if I draw a horizontal line, that is known as Frankfurt horizontal. 
and then we have our mandibular plane angle and where the two bisect creates an angle. That angle in myself is 29 degrees. On average, that angle would be about 25 degrees. If your FMA was, let's say, 10 degrees, then that means that this patient has a skeletal deep bite. And the, the treatment, that gives you a clue that, you know, you might want to treat treatment a little bit differently. Uh, for me, I have a higher FMA because average is 25, I'm 29. So if a patient's like a 28, 29, 30, you know, 32, 34 even, those are high FMAs, which means they have a skeletal open bite, which means if I just straighten my teeth, my teeth will match my skeleton and I will develop a open bite clinically. If you look at the Ceph, I don't have an open bite because I have this blue line curve of ski naturally. Mother Nature gave me that curve of ski to camouflage my skeletal open bite so that I wouldn't have a dental open bite. However, if I orthodontically with braces level that curve of ski on accident, I will have an open bite and those are really hard to reverse. And sometimes when you reverse them, they're unstable and they just forever open again. So you have to be cautious with leveling your curve of ski. These are just some of the clues that we get from the cephalograms and why they're so important. So next what I want to do is I want to trace the ceph uh, so you can see all the points. It goes pretty quick, but you can pause this video and you'll see that you can actually um, see the definition of what you're doing. So what is porion? Where is orbitali exactly? And we always want to calibrate as well. So if I look here, I've calibrated, I just chose 30 millimeters randomly because now I know what five millimeters is or what 10 millimeters is. If you don't calibrate it or if you forget the ruler, um, a cephalogram is really not valid anymore because you don't have any reference of what the distance is. So this is tracing a ceph. This is using dolphin imaging software. Uh, I've done this many times by hand. I've done it many times with the software. Um, as you can tell, I could pretty much do this uh, almost without looking. Uh, just tracing the ceph along, kind of getting all the landmarks. And when you're done tracing it, it actually tells you right away all the angles. So you don't have to get a, a ruler and a protractor and measure them by hand uh, like we used to. You can just use the software for that. And all of these uh, different uh, landmarks are really going to uh, tell me the clues I need on how I would treat myself in this case. So everybody, that is the basics of cephalograms. Why do we take them? Because they offer clues. They're going to help you treat your patient better. They're going to help you avoid mistakes. It's going to help you make a better choice when you're on the fence about which choice to make for treatment planning. So I hope you found that helpful. If you, uh, if you like this, feel free to share it. You can also find more videos on our YouTube channel, or you can check out www.orthovated.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon.